Good afternoon to all, but also good morning and good evening to many of us. It's our pleasure to welcome you to the ITM alumni webinar organized in light of World Malaria Day. In this webinar, ITM alumna and current PhD student Tuan Thi Nguyen will share her PhD research findings on malaria elimination strategies among ethnic minority populations in Vietnam. The main aim of the ITM alumni webinars is to share research findings, expertise, and experiences on a specific international health topic within the ITM community of alumni, but also students, staff, partner institutions, and the wider global health community. I will now briefly explain some of the webinar practicalities. If you want to ask a question, you can use the Q&A option you will have below your screen. If you want to ask a question in live, you can raise your hand. The chat is being disabled for questions. Questions will be moderated and only a select number of questions can be answered in live given the limited time. Unanswered questions cannot be answered af individually afterwards, for which we apologize. At the end of this webinar, a short survey will be displayed and a browser window will open to give your feedback. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available afterwards on the ITM alumni platform and YouTube channel. I will now give the floor to our today's moderator, Kuhn Piet Peters Hritens. Uh, Kuhn is a professor and um, uh, head of the Social Ecological Health Research Unit at ITM. He is a senior lecturer at Nagasaki University, where he is uh, staying right now, and is affiliated to the Amsterdam Institute of Social Science Research. He holds a PhD in social and cultural anthropology and has con conducted extensive research on social cultural factors related to infectious disease transmission dynamics, community perceptions on health and illness, and their impact on the effectiveness of disease prevention, control, and elimination strategies. His professional experience is characterized by high international mobility and extensive field research in low income countries in West Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. Kun, the floor is yours. Hi, good um, yeah, evening here and greetings from Japan. Um, at least I'm a bit closer to Tuan than a lot of you. So um, you all know the difficulties of doing a PhD and being an alumni and trying to find your way forward in the world. So today I'm very happy to present Tuan, who is currently more or less finishing her PhD. Um, but like she says herself, she loves being a PhD student too much that she keeps on reading and writing. So that is, I think is one of the main um, characteristics of a good PhD student that you're always curious and try to keep on learning. So uh, Tuan has a background in journalism originally and then did a master in public health in Paris. She has started working with us like quite some years ago now after doing a course in qualitative and mixed methods. So we were so happy about her work that we picked her up. So her uh, work in Vietnam as well, I think what is most important for me as compared to other people that work in the context is really Tuan's efforts to go to the field and stay to see what is going on locally, even let's say after everybody else has left. And that also gives her specific insights for her PhD that she will present today. So Tuan, please go ahead and share your interesting results. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kuhns, for the nice and kind introductions. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, share my PhD research findings with you today. Um, So um, my PhD research is part of a long-term scientific collaborations between the National Institutes of Malaria in Hanoi and the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. 
So a little bit about malaria in Vietnam. Uh, many scholars refer to malaria in Vietnam as forest malaria. This has a reference to Anopheles virus, which is the main vector uh, responsible for malaria transmissions in the country. So virus is uh, mostly found in natural forests and so it has quite complex behaviors, including outdoor resting and early bitings. Um, an additional challenge for malaria, uh, uh, for vector control uh, in malaria in Vietnam is that uh, the vector has been resistant to uh, current um, insecticides used in, in malaria control interventions. Um, local people living in um, uh, malaria endemics in Vietnam are various ethnic minority groups who speak their own languages, uh, have different cultures from the dominant ethnic cities group, um, and have generally lower socioeconomic status than um, other ethnic, uh, ethnic minority groups living in non-endemic uh, endemic areas and the dominant ethnic groups. Uh, despite all of these challenges uh, with the vectors, uh, vector behaviors and the at-risk groups, uh, Vietnamese governments aim to eliminate all malarias by 2030. So the national malaria strategy is to scale up existing interventions targeting populations with mobility. Uh, so this strategy includes five main interventions. The first one is uh, vector controls using uh, conventional uh, tools such as insecticide treated nets, um, insecticide uh, indoor uh, spraying, and also testing new vector control tools. Uh, uh, they also include active uh, case detection, testing, treatment, and surveillance, um, health campaigns to raise public awareness, and uh, banning actisaminins uh, monotherapy, uh, and research on drug resistance and new treatment regimes. So I'm going to present our first studies on the effectiveness of malaria elimination strategies in South Central Vietnam. So the study took place in Bắc Ai districts of Ninh Thuan province, uh, where the red bubble is on, on the rise of the slide. Uh, the main local populations in Bắc Ai are people of Raklai ethnic cities. They are one of the 53 ethnic groups in Vietnam. Uh, uh, and the main ethnic group is the King uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic city. So the study objective is to understand the contributions of uh, human mobility to persistent malaria transmissions and the impl implications of mobility to malaria elimination strategies. Uh, we use um, an exploratory sequential mixed methods designs with the first qualitative tram to explore the context and the study topics. Then we use the main findings from the first qualitative tram to inform the designs of the surveys in the quantitative trans. And after that, we conducted a second qualitative uh, study to um, contrast findings and also to enrich the interpre interpre interpretations of the uh, meta um, data set. So in the first qualitative trans, uh, we conducted two periods of uh, field works, each was in the month. Uh, we um, uh, made observations, uh, informal conversations, interviews, group discussions with local people. Uh, we selected them uh, purposely and gradually, and we used concurrent thematic analysis. In the cross-sectional surveys, we um, used uh, representative sampling. Um, in the first survey, uh, we uh, recruited household participants, and in the second surveys, we recruited household members. The quantitative uh, data analysis was this descriptive analysis, multinominal and binary logistic regressions. In the second uh, qualitative studies, we use the same uh, sampling and, and analysis strategies. And we also conducted two periods of field works um, uh, with each was in about a month. 
So now I'm going to talk about our findings on mobilities and how it was play out in relation to exposure to the vectors, the uptakes, the bed nets, and public health services. So we first look into our vector exposures in where people live. I'm going to show a video. So this is the new village where the government resettles the Raklai uh, people. Um, people were provided with brick houses and bed nets and other public services, but people couldn't afford the living costs in the new village. Uh, people moved back to their traditional territory where they call the old village. Uh, there, uh, they organized their societies and continue slash and burn agriculture. Uh, living and working conditions was very hard, uh, but people didn't have to pay uh, for daily food uh, and agriculture uh, inputs, such as electricity, um, fertilizers and um, uh, irrigation service. Uh, then we looked into housings uh, and exposures. On the rise, you see a typical brick house, uh, which is commonly found in the new village. It has closed structures and made of uh, strong materials, but people didn't live in this house for um, all year long. On the rise, you see a typical traditional house uh, of the Raklai, uh, which is made of uh, nationally um, locally available materials. It uh, usually has a gap between the walls and, 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 the, uh, and the roof and um, uh, also gaps between wooden planks in the walls, which mosquitoes and insects could come in the house. Um, people live in the uh, old village, combine slash and burn agricultures and other uh, subsistence activities in the forest, like fishing, logging, collection of forest vegetations. Uh, some of these activities required people to sleep in the forest. On the rise, you see a temporary shelter um, uh, for people who needed to sleep in the forest. Uh, on, sorry, on the left, you see the temporary shelter. And on the rise, you see people sleeping in the open in the forest. Um, uh, the government imposed regulations on forest lands and uh, forest resource management. Uh, so the government has turned the traditional Raglai territory into protected forests. People were not supposed to live there. Um, and this has direct impacts on vector control interventions. Uh, people who stay in the old village couldn't reveal their mobilities and location in the forest because that might imply uh, uh, legal consequences on them. And the local malaria uh, control program couldn't easily identify and target them because people didn't reveal their, their status. And also malaria, uh, local malaria program wasn't supposed to provide bed nets or um, health services in areas that isn't considered residential areas like the forest where the Raklai live. Next, we look into uptakes of bed nets. Uh, we observe bed nets in all villages. You see on um, the left, uh, bed nets being discarded in, uh, in the nature uh, when it was torn or uh, when it was broken. Um, we also observe um, alter, uh, alternative use of bed nets. On the rise, you see net was being cut to cover the gap between the, the roof and the walls of the house. Uh, we observe bed nets in the new village, but similar to the old village, uh, all the alternative uh, use of bed nets was seen in many occasions. Like this picture shows uh, net was used to protect animals from entering the garden. Uh, we found that um, uh, the ownership of bed nets was much higher than uh, the new village, than the old village. For example, 55% of households um, had um, bed nets 
for, for had at least one bed net for average of uh, two persons in the households. Um, these figures in the uh, old village was only 5%. Uh, similarly, the number of households who didn't have bed nets in the new village was 4%. But these figures in the old village was 51%. Uh, multi-nominal logistic regression shows that the odds of um, uh, irregular bed net use defines as when people said that they sometimes slept under a bed net was much higher among household members who slept in a steel house, went to the forest or practiced slash and burn agriculture. Uh, for example, a household members who slept in a steel house had 2.3 times the odds of irregular bed net use compared to someone who did not. Uh, third, we look into uptakes of health services. We found that 65% of um, household representatives um, heard of malaria before. 57% of them uh, said that malaria could be cured. However, people didn't um, know a lot about malaria symptoms and malaria treatments. Uh, people selected treatment options like doing nothing, taking over the counter medicines, making traditional ritual to honor the ancestor, or taking uh, injections or intravenous drips to treat malaria. Uh, in Bak Ai, active surveillance was implemented. Local health workers actively looked for people who live in the forest to test for malaria. But they said that it was very difficult to find, uh, to find people because people was on the move all the time. Uh, we found that 62% of uh, household members said that they uh, sought for public um, house services in their recent uh, illness. Uh, and 19% of them specifically look for treatments for fevers at the public health facilities. 6% of them said that they eventually had malaria. Uh, primary health care, including um, uh, treatments and diagnostics for malaria was provided free of charge at the public health facilities. Um, however, people explained to us that they only well went to public health facilities when they suspected that they had malaria. For fevers, they prefer buying uh, over-the-counter uh, medications in the private sectors to reduce traveling distance and times, and also the long waiting times at the public health facility. So the implications of, of these findings on mobility to malaria elimination strategies. Uh, first, uh, my study, uh, the study shows that um, uh, people um, chose to be mobile uh, in the forest for various purposes. And forest mobility among the rocklays was closely linked to their social economic strategies. So this implies that um, the malaria, the local malaria elimination strategy needs to improve their assumptions. This, um, uh, this assumption um, was by settling the rock lays in new villages, people would end mobility and activities in the forest. And by providing um, malaria interventions and services in new villages, it would be sufficient to eliminate forest malaria. Second, the study also shows that um, it's uh, important to make um, local malaria strategy accountable for social factors in, um, uh, in malaria. My, the study shows that people continue to practice slash and burn agricultures and living in the forest. And the existing vector, tool, vector control tools was not adapted like bed nets or, or um, uh, insecticide um, residual spray was not adapted to the context and the working and living conditions of the local people. 
Uh, now I'm going to present um, our second studies, which is also a mixed method study conducted in the same locations in Bakai district. So the context of the second study was that uh, there has been a recent change in malaria epidemiologies in Vietnam. The case loss of uh, Vivac malaria has increased. Um, and uh, uh, surveillance shows that um, Vivac malaria has become increasingly dominant in malaria in, in the remaining uh, endemic areas in Vietnam. There are some specific characteristics about Vivac malaria. First, it causes a dormant phase in the liver that is asymptomatic and undetectable by existing uh, blood testing tools. Second, it could cause relapse months, even years after the initial infections. And third, uh, primoquine, which is the first line treatment for Vivax, requires 14 days of uh, treatment, uh, treatment uh, administration, and it could cause severe side effects among patients who are GCPD uh, deficiency. So um, GCPD testing was not uh, systematically provided to malaria patients prior to this study. GCPD testing requires quite sophisticated laboratory capacity and facility. In Vietnam, it was available in specialized hospital and at national level. At the district and community level, this um, uh, testing service was either absent or fragmented. Uh, so the idea in this study was to design and develop a rapid uh, diagnostic test for G6PD, which is um, easily, um, uh, is, which is friendly, easily, um, which is easy uh, to use for community health workers and easily available at the community. However, it requires each patient to uh, give at least 7.5 milliliters of venous blood to run the test. So in this study, the um, objective was to explore the acceptability of radical cures and GCPD testing among Raglay community members. So we use a similar uh, mixed method study designs as the first study. The only difference in the study designs in this study is in the quantitative study. We conducted two uh, uh, surveys. The first one was with household representatives. We used randomized sampling. And this, the second survey, we recruited patients at health facilities. Um, by patients, we screened for those who had fevers within uh, 48 hours before their medical service, uh, older than 12 months of age, and consented to participate in the study. And we only use uh, descriptive analysis as a quantitative um, analysis strategies. So now I'm going to present uh, our findings on mobilities and how it was play out in relation to malaria surveys, trust and uptake of the novel GCPD testing. So in this study, obviously we have conducted qualitative studies. We gained some understandings about local people, the context, uh, and we conducted several uh, sensitization meetings to explain to local people uh, what was the study about, um, how they could participate and what was expected of them. However, during the survey weeks, uh, we observed that only elderly women and children showed up. Um, participants explained to us that adults, uh, small children and young adults uh, was, was either uh, unwilling to participate, to participate or the adults was away, uh, not present at home. So to understand, uh, about the people who didn't participate and why. We went to, to the old village. So this picture shows 
uh, part of the route from the from the new village to the old village. So usually it took some a person between two and six hours to walk from the new village to the old village if weather was good, meaning no raining. And so in this context, obviously, people who lived and worked in the old village just couldn't interrupt their, their work and return um, to the new village to participate in the survey. So to uh, address this challenge, the survey team went to the old village. But even there, we, we had a difficulty uh, uh, recruiting people because people were working in the field, in the forest all the time. Um, the only window that was present at home in the old village was between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. But still, many people explained to us that they were willing to give finger pricks, um, uh, uh, to follow finger prick procedures for malaria testing, but not venous blood sampling. People explained that blood was considered an important part of their health and would affect to their working conditions, um, working capacities, sorry. Uh, so a, a participant explained to us, blood is given to us by our ancestors. Some people had bad blood, some people had good blood. Bad blood makes a person sick. She or he has all kind of infl inflammation in the body and in the blood. Small children are not strong. They would get sick and weak if giving too much blood to the survey. Uh, we found out that uh, amongst uh, participants in the health facility-based surveys, only 5% heard about two types of malaria. 4% said that, they, uh, that each type of malaria had different symptoms. Um, and 11% uh, of them suspected their fever was caused by malaria. Of 176 participants, eight of them was malaria positive, including two was um, uh, viva positive. So the surveys also confirm the qualitative findings about um, uh, multiple um, occupations in the forest. 86% of households was active in slash and burn uh, farming. 67% of them was active in forest plantation work. 75% um, of them didn't know about different types of malaria. 70% did not know about the possibility of relapse. However, 94% of them was willing to take prescribed uh, malaria treatment uh, by a health professional for asymptomatic uh, infection. And 91% was willing to complete, to complete um, malaria treatment for uh, asymptomatic um, infection, even when they felt better. So to, uh, to understand why people were willing to uh, take the treatments for uh, asymptomatic uh, malaria infection, with, even though they had the limited understanding of Vivax and the different types of malaria, uh, we found that um, available health materials um, uh, was about malaria and vivac malaria and treatments was only in Vietnamese language. But many Raklai people didn't read or understand Vietnamese language. There was limited communication between patients and health professionals. So local health professionals was mainly from King, the dominant ethnic city. They didn't speak Raklai language, and they didn't explain to patients um, about the different types of malaria, nor the treatment. On the size of the patients, they were unwilling to ask uh, their doctors about the diagnosis and treatment because they was afraid the doctor would complain that they were taking times or um, that they challenged the, the, the medical knowledge of, of the doctor. Uh, language barriers and complicated inter-ethnic relationship also influence trust uh, in biomedicine. Uh, a malaria patient explained to us, when I was told by the nurse that I had malaria, it was wrong. I felt wrong. I do not dare to doubt the diagnosis by the nurse, but I could not believe the results. 
I have lived my entire life in the forest and never had malaria. I can't believe that I have malaria. Another participant, another malaria patient explained to us, I do not know which disease that I had, only the doctor knows. Even if they explains at all, there was no way that I could know which disease that I got. I only knew where I had pain in my body, my head or my arm, but I would know if it is a bad doctor. Bad doctors could not cure me. And still they charge me a lot of money. Uh, mobility and trust also have a direct impact on diagnosis and treatment, VIVAPs, uh, treatment practices for VIVAPs. So in theory, health professionals uh, would give uh, VIVAP patients 14 days of, of primoquine and assumes uh, their adherence. Um, patient went home after receiving the medications and uh, there was no way for uh, health professionals to follow up or to check whether the patient completed their medications. At local, at communal and district level, uh, local health workers didn't have the capacity nor uh, medical resources to handle side effects of, of um, uh, primoquines. And in case patients have side effects, that would imply um, uh, damages to their uh, reputations. For that reason, local health workers had fears of giving full doses of primoquine to VIVAC patients. So the implications of the study to the uh, of the study fighting to the local malaria elimination elimination strategy is um, this is uh, the study shows that um, mobility presents a different kind of challenge to malaria surveys and studies on new biotechnological solutions for, mal for malaria eliminations. The study shows that even when a biotechnological solution such as GCPD testing was available to the local uh, population, but if people do not trust health professionals and have concerns about the safety of the medications and the necessity of blood testing, the rollouts of, of uh, novel GCPD testing and radical cues are, is expected to face limited uptakes among the local population. So based on the two studies, uh, we draw um, up some uh, recommendations. The main recommendation is that public health interventions are not and should not be independent from the local context. The problem of mobility and persistent malaria transmissions require innovative methodological approaches and that uh, formative research with iterative processes um, that include community participations would offer a way forward in working with marginalized communities and include their voices in the intervention designs, implementations, and evaluation, and eventually would improve the overall uptake and effectiveness of local malaria elimination strategies. So uh, I'm going to end my presentation here. Um, I would like to thank the participants in the studies, the local authorities in, in Bac Ai and Ning Chuan province, and the study team's uh, members of uh, the National Institutes of Malaria and Hanoi and Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, Without them, uh, it would be impossible for my PhD research. Um, now I, I uh, uh, look forward to uh, questions and exchange with you from the uh, audience. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan, for the presentation, the pictures and the small uh, videos. I don't know if there's any questions. Yes, has anybody raised their hand? Or well, you can stop, uh, ty start typing in the Q&A box. Um, maybe in, 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 in the meantime, uh, could you tell us a little bit more? I think you used like ethnographic methods for part of the research. Could you explain that a little bit more and how, how that was relevant for the study? 
until we wait and we get other questions. Uh, yes. So I, um, in in my PhD research, I um, used quite extensively at, um, ethnographic approach to data collections. Uh, that means I stays and live with the study populations. I stays in different villages, um, in the study areas with local people. I had different Rakhlai hosts, and I I built. I spent times with them, following them to the forest. To the fields, uh, I participate. Uh, I, I participated in their daily activities, social activities, and um, all of this were to build confidence and and trust uh, uh, with people. Because obviously, me as a uh, woman from King and Nick City, from the city, uh, I imply certain. Um, uh, uh, how does the hesitation um, for local people? So with this awareness, I was actively um, using ethnographic approach, and I found that it was uh, it's offer me rich data and also help me to uh, be aware of my own my personal bias and also work on my my bias in. Um, data collections and interpretations of findings. Uh, thank you very much. I may see there is a question in the chat by Suzanne Dedix. Uh, explain, asking you to explain a little bit my, why is why is there some specific forms or types of distrust between the populations and, for example, the health staff, public health, um, how come there is this distrust that you talk about that has to be overcome? Yeah. So uh, thank you for the questions. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, trust is an important finding in, in the study. Um, so the, the background for the, for the distrust or mistrust among the population at the highest level had to do with the resettlement of rock lays out of the forest moving them out of their traditional territory and putting them in, in the new village where uh, they are even more disadvantaged in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, social economic activities. And the second, um, the integrations of, of uh, king ethnicity, king the dominant ethnicity in the Raklai traditional territory and um, assigning important positions in the local government to the dominant ethnic city groups and the dominance of uh, king health professionals in the local health uh, system also implies, you know, um, uh, um, the, the elements of dominating, of assimilating the, the Raklais. So, in defense, uh, the Raklais went back to, to the old village and also in the house settings, in the public house settings, the key messages um, for malaria um, also portrays Raklai people as, as backwards, as living, as carrying the disease by continuing a risk behavior, living in the forest, uh, not sleeping under bed nets, so when malaria patients enter these health facilities, it was kind of expected for King Health professionals to really explain in person that by sleeping in the forest and in the old village, you continue, the, the patient would continue carrying malaria parasites and it would it's continue sustaining malaria transmission causing burdens for the local health system and the local governments. And that the, that the interpretations on the, on the patient side. So all of that, um, you know, the, the, the general inter-ethnic um, relations and limited communications and also the focus very much on uh, risk behavior, behavior change, make the patients on really the silent end that the patient had nothing to say and couldn't say anything and having to accept 
uh, the messages having to accept to the government interventions on them, which further uh, put them further into poverty. Because if they didn't go to the forest, there wouldn't be economic op opportunity uh, for them in the new village. There wasn't available farming land for them in the new village. So yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, for my uh, no, a related question or the second part of the question then is if if uh, like community participation is realistic and under these conditions? Uh, it's, it's simply not practical at all. People had to work uh, every day uh, in the fields and they had to go from, from one spot in the forest to another because the, availab the availability of small valley in the mountains was limited. So that's where they went to, to, uh, for farming in the forest. So people don't have one particular spot in the forest. They could have several. So it means that people move to many locations in the forest for farming. So demanding people to be present in the new village for community participation, meaning they have to abandon their farming, taking a long distance to go back to the village and participating in the solutions for malaria that was imposed by, by the people from the higher social economic status who criticize or who kind of thinks that their living and their residence in the forest is bad or is negative. Uh, thank you, Tuan. Another question from Sin de Koning is what did you find the most difficult doing field work with mobile populations in Vietnam? Uh, for me personally, building trust and language barriers was a two main challenge. I could overcome living for weeks without, um, or days or weeks uh, in very limited conditions without electricity, without mobile phone coverage and having to walk uh, um, and you know, in the heat, blah, blah, blah. But language barrier was a real challenge for me. I wanted to speak the language of local people, but I couldn't spend uh, really the time on, I mean, by spending time on building trust, collecting data within the limited time of the, of the PhD um, timeline, it wasn't really possible for me to spend time to learn the language. I could speak basic words and sentences in their language, but Meaningful conversation wasn't possible. Uh, wasn't possible for me. Thank you, um, Tuan. Uh, another question, for example, here from just think you can answer relatively briefly is about from uh, Sun Soka about the acceptability of long-lasting nets in Vietnam as part of the malaria control interventions. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the studies in Ming Tuan's pointed to uh, better presence and use in both um, uh, new village and, the, and old village. Uh, but people didn't bring the net to the forest to sleep in the open air, for example. It was because it's, it wasn't uh, possible for them and it wasn't useful for them to bring the net to the, uh, to the forest. And so, so to use the net in such housing conditions, as I shows in the pictures, uh, the durabilities of the net and the effective of the nets is questionable because people live in such small um, bamboo wooden housings uh, and open structures that bed nets could be turned fairly easily and, and quite fast. Uh, so yeah. Definitely, there, there, there are things to improve in the designs of BATnet. Another question here, which I think is a bit of a challenging question, but I, I think we should try nevertheless, by Eugene uh, Yeka is, um, what preventive interventions could you propose that are more community friendly and you think would work best? So I think that's a challenging question, but any ideas around what could work? Um, yes, we certainly, in this study, we certainly looked into this and questioned ourselves what could work in this challenging uh, location and with such specific uh, populations. 
so I think in terms of preventive um, uh, measures and preventive tools, um, you know, in Vietnam, bed nets is globally procured and provided to people following standard design, regardless of family size, of housing, of uh, sleeping arrangements. But locally, we have a capacity to make bed nets. You know, Vietnam is, has become uh, the factory for international um, textile companies. So yeah, I, I truly believe that it's possible to improve the designs of the net, but we need people, we need people, local people to take part and dis discuss on what, is, what they think is relevant and is useful and could, could be useful for them. Thank you. Um, one, one other very tricky question, of course, by Anne Um It's like after defending your PhD and perhaps going for a postdoc, what would you like to research next? Like what are your burning research questions that come out of the study you have done now? Like where would you like to invest your time and in, in the future? Thank I know you, you are finishing your PhD and try not to think about the future, but it's nevertheless <laughs> try. I mean, I I, I, I I was trained in public health and with this uh, PhD, I really opened my eyes to learn about many kind of challenges from the local context to public health intervention strategies. So I think if I could choose the topics, that I would continue working on after this PhD is to continue looking into studying marginalized populations and see how public health interventions could be tailored or could, could be improved to, to be effective uh, in these populations. Because I think the rock lakes wasn't only having problems with malaria, they also had many other health problems. And I think this standardized approach in public health would face similar challenges like malaria control strategy in this, in this um, setting. Yeah, and I, I think the topic would really keep me going is to, um, yeah, to, to see how from research we could improve um, intervention designs and make it more useful and effective for local people. Thank you. Uh, Srun, Srun also has a question like, what about outdoor biting? Uh, any preventive measures for outdoor, outdoor biting? How do you see outdoor biting? Maybe also interesting to consider is, do you think the outdoor biting is the main challenge or indoor biting or what is the relation? Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah. It's, it's, it's um, an important question for vector control, thank you. Um, in the Raglai setting, for people who live in the old village, uh, there isn't much difference between being indoor and outdoor. The house has open structure, people spending all their times uh, during daytime, working in the fields, in the forest. And, you know, in this, um, I mean, when they, work on maize cultivation, for example, then it's in the sun. But when they went to the forest to collect uh, mushrooms or flowers, or when they went early for fishing in the river, it's, it's um, uh, daytime and night times, there's li little bit, uh, there's very little difference because people are highly exposed to the vectors. Uh, so I think in terms of outdoor preventions would be a very challenge uh, for vector control because how, how, yeah, how to protect people, even it's super hot, even you would have uh, insecticide treated clothing. How do you convince people to, to wear this uh, cloth um, in such high humidity and, and heat? while they're constantly having to move, having to walk, carrying stuff, getting to the water and walking, doing manual work. Uh, there is one more question here from Frederic Sinjinza. Um, any role of community-directed activities? Uh, we have already talked a bit 
about community participation, but um, are there any like community based initiatives that happen in relation to control or uh, do you think that is feasible in a setting like Vietnam? Um, it's, it's, um, it's, um, I mean, the assumption, another assumption of the national strategy uh, for malaria elimination is that when they made free of charge, uh, testing, diagnosis, uh, treatment to, to um, at risk communities, people would automatically participate in the interventions. Plus these public health campaigns would even increase people uptakes of public health um, uh, interventions. So that's the, the, the assumption. But as I shows in the study, there was there isn't direct or or um, uh, there isn't um, uh, a specific initiative to engage uh, local people in in, in the intervention. Um, yeah, and and as a recommendation, I think in such testing like like Bug Eyes, who requires innovative methodological approach to like the formative research design to to find ways to dialogues and, and, and work with local people. Uh, maybe one last question, I think, because then it's time to round up. You didn't only do research among the Rakhle, but also in different settings of Vietnam. Um, were your findings similar in relation to like the last malaria cases, or do you see very big differences, or you think your findings can be applied in different settings of Vietnam to reduce malaria further? Um, uh, thank you for, for the question. Um, I conducted uh, my PhD research in other settings, in other ethnic minority settings in Vietnam. And um, I looked really into mobility strategies and how, how it is play out in terms of inter-ethnic uh, relations and malaria elimination strategies. And there are similar findings, uh, not exactly the same, but similar findings regarding the limited uptakes of the interventions, mistrust and distrust in uh, public health interventions, health professionals, and also this, um, the gaps between uh, standardized uh, um, interventions and the local context. Um, so yeah, that implies that uh, is, uh, is, is important and relevant to understand why and how people are mobile in the forest and what are the, the implications to malaria control and how also ideas on how malaria interventions could or should modify their strategy to, to improve the effectiveness. Okay, Tuan, uh, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. I think maybe a last recommendation for other PhD students that are at the end of their PhD. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm so grateful for, uh, for having this opportunity to do uh, re PhD research in my own country and in, in my own settings. And it's uh, personally, it's, it's very fulfilling and intellectually uh, meaningful for me. Uh, and I really think that uh, for other PhD students, I mean, uh, there are challenges and not all of the challenges we face in our field works are the same. Uh, but do uh, take advantage of, of um, uh, like people like me who, who are sandwich PhD students do take advantage of uh, having connections and having uh, worked with both institutions in your home country and with ITM to discuss on um, how you know the larger teams could help you with your field work or would help you with with solving the problems that you face in your field works and that uh, you know it's always challenging to do a PhD it wasn't meant to be easy but it's very fulfilling I and mean, it's um, no pain no gain as they say and um, we're gonna meet. Uh, like-minded people and uh, I don't so think that is another um, is another um, bonus for doing a PhD.
Okay, thank you. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. it's it's also to me eh, to say uh, thank you very much uh, to Twen eh, for sharing your uh, your research findings eh, of your PhD. Um, also, Kuhn eh, for uh, the moderation of uh, of this webinar, and also to the participants uh, for uh, sharing your. Uh, your uh, questions and uh, uh, yeah, to exchange um, with both the moderator and uh, the speaker. I also would like to ask now, we've launched the polling, so please uh, uh, complete the polling um, so that we can take uh, the results back. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we hope to see you in another upcoming uh, webinar, which will be announced uh, on all ITM social media and alumni uh, media channels. Uh, thank you once more, Twan. All the best also with uh, sharing the final results of your PhD. And uh, uh, in the meantime, to all uh, stay uh, safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for making the time for my presentation. Thank you, Charlotte and Kuhn, for your help. Thank you, Twan. Thank you, Kuhn. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.